really want today to feel like a casual conversation, right? This is your time. We want these questions to be pertained to you. We want you to be able to um, really find this time valuable. Um, so we've gotten some questions that we've received at the point that you registered for this event. Um, but at any point, if you have questions, raise your hand. Um, we be happy to call on you, put them in the chat um, and really want to, to make sure that this time is valuable for you and that you getting your questions answered. Um, and wanna do a quick shout out uh, to our first year programs assistant, Claudia, who is helping manage the chat and is um, providing some backend assistance. So shout out to Claudia. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna pass this off to our panelists um, and ask them to uh, introduce themselves. My name is Brian, um, I know the flyer says licensed clinical social worker. I'm actually an LMSW, which makes a little bit of a difference in New York in terms of uh, what you can do, scope of practice. Um, I've had my LMSW or my MSW since 2011, got licensed shortly after I finished grad school, um, started working in outpatient like substance use, mental health, and then I um, went from outpatient to probation uh, for like four or five years, and then the Department of Corrections for a couple years, uh, where I worked in a prison. Um, so I was there for the majority of the time I've been in social work, and then more recently, over the past few years, I started working uh, for the VA, uh, which is where I work today at the Rochester Outpatient Clinic location, which is in Western New York. Thanks so much, Brian L. We'll do Brian E. Yeah, so my name is Brian Eman. Um, I originally started in the non for profit world before coming to the federal government. So I was actually working as a case manager in uh, homeless shelters right out of grad school. So with my MSW, it is a concentration in mental health. Um, my offices were right there at a men's emergency shelter. Um, from there, I went to uh, being the program manager for a women's shelter and also a, a separate uh, youth shelter here in the city of Rochester. I then transitioned to the federal government where I, I now work exclusively with homeless veterans. Um, I've gone from the being the point of contact or POC, which basically meant I engaged homeless veterans where they were in the community, um, placing them in shelters to now as the safe haven liaison, I kind of oversee veterans that are in care here at the shelter. Um, here at the safe haven. So um, pretty much made, you know, been with homeless for you know, almost seven years now. And this is kind of my field and um, definitely my, my area of interest, like I said, since graduate school, um, this is kind of where I'm at. Thanks so much, Brian E. And Dr. Is it Huber? Is that how you say it? Or Huber? Yeah. Uh, actually, I go by Dr. Hong Huber, but yeah, there, sure, sorry. go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Dr. Christina Hong Huber. I am a licensed clinical psychologist down in the Washington DC metro area. Um, I guess a little bit about me after college, I actually started off in my first uh, doctoral program as doing a PhD uh, focusing on neuroscience, neuropsychophysiology. Realized that was not really my cup of tea. So I got my master's in clinical psychology and then I left and I realized I was really much more interested in doing um, sort of in-person clinical work. So which is why it led me to getting my PsyD, that's a doctor of psychology and clinical psychology. So right now I do private practice. I work with mostly adults and couples, and I specialize in working with trauma, anxiety, depression, relational issues, uh, multicultural concerns. And um, I also do some consulting work for uh, law firms as well as nonprofits. So um, I try to be as involved as possible um, in some of the nonprofit area in addition to having my own private practice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully uh, Christy will, will join us soon, but we're, we're going to keep forging ahead. So um, as I said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, I'll get us started with uh, a few questions of, from folks that have um, come in uh, at the point of registration, but please, please ask. Um, so the first one is, uh, what degrees and certifications are required for your field? And so I guess maybe I'm going to open it up a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about some of the, the differences um, that some of the certifications and degrees can offer. Um, I know for students who are kind of at the beginning stages, it can be a little intimidating to understand what are all these letters at the end of your name and what is the difference between a PsyD, a PhD, and LCSW and MSW. Um, 
And so if anybody wanted to jump in and we can kind of just tag team, it'd be. So I think at least for, and, and Brian can speak to this too, you know, at least for us, I think, you know, in your undergrad, I, a bachelor of social work isn't required. I, I think eventually if you want to get into clinical work, um, you will eventually need an MSW and then to be licensed in that particular state. So you will need to be at least a licensed master of social work. Um, if you want to go further and either do private practice or kind of have some oversight with clinical work, you will eventually need that, you know, LCSW, um, which would be another set of, you know, clinical hours, another examination. Um, and I think after that, there's an LCSWR. So the, there are some, you know, quite a few steps to this, but as you kind of progress, you know, in your, in your professional career, you, you'll kind of just be working towards it naturally. So it, it, it does seem daunting at first, but, but it does kind of work, you know, collaboratively, collaboratively with your like, professional experience as you go along. And Dr. Hong Cooper, you said you started in a PhD program and you transitioned to a PsyD program. Can you maybe talk to um, everybody a little bit about what made you or helped you make that decision and what you found the differences in those two programs were? Yeah. Um, so just in a nutshell, I would say the difference between a PsyD and a PhD is for a PhD, you're really focusing on, uh, you know, doing research and they're trying to, um, what's the right word? Uh, sort of develop academic clinic, um, academic clinicians or researchers. So you're really putting in a lot of time devoted into research and maybe a little bit less with sort of the clinical work. Um, for a PsyD program, they're really trying to um, establish and develop, you know, clinicians. So sort of the focus or uh, goals for the programs are a little bit different. So if you're really wanting to do a more so clinical work, I think a study makes more sense. If you're wanting to maybe go into academia and have, you know, do research, have your own lab, then a PhD might be a better fit. There's also financial dif differences as well in a PhD. Uh, if you're in a well-funded program, they will pay for your tuition and they will give you a, a tuition remission as well as a stipend. Uh, study programs, a lot of them, they do not. Um, the, the amount of years also differs as well. Societies and PhDs are anywhere from about five to seven years or so. Um, but I think the biggest difference is what are you wanting to go in? Are you wanting to go in to become a clinician versus um, an academic or a researcher? And if I could just add one more thing, the reason why I went, went back to get my doctorate is that um, in addition to doing, you know, psychotherapy and seeing patients, I also wanted to have the flexibility of doing some of these assessments. So like psychoeducational, psychodiagnostic, even some of these neuropsychological uh, evaluations. And please correct me if I'm wrong uh, from the other two. Uh, I believe you have to have a doctorate in order to do some of these types of assessments. Um, or maybe you might be able to do them if you're supervised, but I wanted to have that ability to do assessments in addition to um, psychotherapy. So there are some things that you might get um, uh, if you decide to go get your doctorate. Granted, there is a, um, you know, you have to sacrifice more time, more money. So there's a lot that goes into it as well. Thank you so much. Um, so one of our next questions is, uh, at what point did you decide like this was the career for you and that you were on the right path? Um, and the second part, which I guess actually would come first if I had read the question all the way through is how did your interest in human, uh, psychology and human services come about? And then at what point did you decide, uh, that this career was the right, right path for you? If each of you, I don't know, maybe Brian L, you want to get us started? You look sure. Like go, um, yeah. <laughs> mine actually uh, took a while to figure out that this is what I wanted to do. Um, I went into undergrad and really didn't have much of an idea. I started out as a business major and then thought I'd be more interested in psychology or sociology and really ended up finishing with just a sociology degree with like a minor in business because by the time everything was said and done, like four years was done and like I need to to have a degree basically and I still <laughs> did not have a great idea of what I wanted to do um and then I worked with my dad who owned a financial planning business um and after doing that for a couple years um knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do <laughs> and thought that with some research um you know, psychology, generally speaking, was kind of the way I wanted to go. And in where I was, Western New York, it seemed like um, an MS 
USW, a master of social work, and there's other, um, you know, doctorate programs, obviously a little bit more time, or even like a licensed mental health counselor. It seemed like an MSW would have had the most range in terms of being in that general field and then deciding ultimately what I wanted to do as I finished up in grad school is filled with long internships where you really get a feel for what you want to do. That helped a lot. Um, in the program I went to, you could choose between um, mental health concentration, um, child and family concentration, or a policy concentration. So based on that, you could kind of start to go in the right direction. Um, but I would say it really wasn't until I was, you know, finishing grad school that I started to have an idea that I would be probably more interested in criminal justice within the social work field. Thanks so much. Brian E? I probably have the least exciting or least interesting story. <laughs> I, I, was, I was offered a graduate assistant position at uh, where I went and did my undergrads. So they offered me a, a chance to basically pay for my master's and I had to decide did I want to go for an education um, degree or psychology, a master's of, I think it was master's of psychology, master's of clinical psych, or a master's of social work. And I just, I just picked social work. I, I really didn't have a background in, in social work, psychology. My undergrad was actually a philosophy degree. Um, so I just, I went with social work and, you know, from my, my first internship, like I said, at the, you know, at the shelter, um, while my program, I, I realized this is, this is the right program for me and I'm in with the right, you know, with the right population and the right program. So. And, it, and was it that experience that made you realize that, like, this is what you wanted? Yeah, I think, I think it was that experience was being around those people. Um, some people I actually still kind of work with now, where I still, you know, kind of collaborate with in the community anyway, um, to just, you know, being, you know, being around, you know, that population, being around um, some people that just with very good hearts, um, you know, to serve others. And I think, uh, yeah, like I said, that's what I think made me kind of stick with the program, eventually getting the MSW and being licensed in New York State. Awesome. And Dr. Hong Hoover? Um, so I've always been interested in psychology, and I took a psych course in high school, which sort of solidified my interest. So actually ended up going to my undergrad uh, because it has it was known for having a great psychology department. Um, and I ended up getting my uh, bachelor's of science in more of a neuroscience uh, degree because that, um, I guess for my family, I don't think they really understood what psychology was, but neuroscience seemed a little bit more concrete. So that then led to me getting uh, going into a PhD program. It was a PhD in clinical psychology, but it was really focusing on more of the neuroscience aspect. So I was doing a lot of fMRI EEG work. Uh, so I was doing a lot of neuropsychophysiology, neuropsych but there was really not a lot of patient interaction, which is what I realized I re was really interested in, which is why I went from going kind of the more research route to going the more clinician route to a society. Yeah. And, you know, I just am going to point out that each of our panelists have talked about these different experiences, right? And so I know at John Jay, when we're talking about your coursework and course selection, and it's super important, don't get me wrong, but it's these experiences when you're really able to decide, like Brian L., oh man, I really don't want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> or you decide, oh my gosh, I really like this part of the job. And so I'm going to explore what that looks like going further and deeper working with patients or clients or this a particular population, right? And so when we talk about all these opportunities and applying for things and getting internships, it's not just because, you know, we want to stress everybody out, but that's really how you start to get a feel for what you like and what you don't like. And it'll help you make better decisions when it comes to your coursework too. Um, and so, you know, uh, one of our, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to keep saying it. And I'm going to, I'm going to get a question by the end of this. Um, at, at what point, uh, yo, yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Um, so what would you say is your favorite part of your job? The paperwork, right? That's what everybody's <laughs> going to say. Yeah. No, I think seeing the transition of, um, when you see a person kind of, you know, have those gaps and like missing or, um, basic needs. So, so those, those missing parts of whether it be, you know, food insecurity, you know, homelessness, um, educational things, employment things, or, you know, we talk about substance abuse, addiction, or behavioral health concerns, kind of seeing that the, someone to start that process and then kind of 
kind of coming out the other side or just just that transition of that journey and kind of that destination where, where, where people can end up you know we as much as we talk about you know we talk about kind of the, not the, the bad side of it but the, the challenging and the kind of the, the difficult work we do but there are those success stories i think that's probably the, the most encouraging and the best part of the best part of the work keeps you motivated yeah keeps keeps you coming back yeah brian al dr hong huber Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. It says my network is slow. So um, if I freeze. Federal government. I mean, we all go to CUNY, so. Just let me know. <laughs> um, I like uh, a couple. Am I freezing? A little bit, but you're, you seem to be flowing now. Okay. There you go. Um, now you're good. So I started um, at the VA on the veterans crisis line, um, which was all over uh, the phone or chat or text. Um, and that was a great way to learn like crisis intervention. Um, but it also was extremely hard. And I knew that I didn't wanna just uh, deal with people only through uh, social media or phone, those platforms. Um, so where I am now, um, I will work with, with a point of contact and go into a shelter to get into stable housing and um, keep them housed and keep their medical health good and their mental health as good as possible. So I like the uh, aspect of actually going out, seeing people, uh, meeting them where they're at and um, kind of getting, um, getting to know them, um, just their day-to-day -day life, but also at the same time, using your clinical skills to see how they're doing, um, you know, in terms of their mental health status, do they need extra support um, and just being able to sort of get out of the office and um, kind of work with them. Yeah, being able to see them in their own environment, I'm sure. And, and it, it's a good change of scenery too. And, you know, like these are important things to think about when you're deciding these different fields and different areas and types of jobs that you want or like, what do you want your day-to-day -to, -day to look like, right? And I think that the ability to get out of the office for some folks is really important. And so it's important to think about that. Uh, Dr. Hong Huber, what would you say your, your most favorite part of your job is? Oh, gosh. Um, so I've been really fortunate that I guess through my various uh, programs and training opportunities, I've been able to, I've been an out, inpatient, outpatient community mental health. I've been in uh, college counseling centers. I've been at private, uh, private schools. And it's nice, it's interesting to see that, of course, there's a variability in terms of basic needs and that there are certainly certain people who have more, um, you know, safety and stability when it comes to, you know, um, housing or food or whatnot, but I think probably the thing that I most value is being able to, as cheesy as it sounds, being able to connect with my patients, um, because even if you are financially very secure, there's something that everyone struggles with. Um, so I think being able to, um, you know, provide support, help them process through a lot of these traumas, because there can be traumas happening at a financial level, at a relational level, you know, based not having basic needs, of course, that's traumatic. So I think across the board, regardless of what setting I've been at, I think there's just trauma that's so abundant and being able to help and hold that trauma with them. I think that is such a empowering ability to be able to be seen and, and have your um, trauma be recognized. So I think that has been such something that I've always been so honored to be a part of that experience with them. And then I think to echo what Brian said, being able to watch that transformation whether it's having them be able to think about things in new ways or be able to regulate their emotions or be able to get out of maybe relationships that might be very unhealthy or toxic. So I think that for me is such a powerful opportunity for myself and for the client to be able to connect in that way and to give them kind of a new corrective experience. Awesome. And so kind of the flip side to that, what would you say is the most challenging aspect of your, of your current jobs? I don't know if you want to start with, I feel like Dr. Hong Kuber, you end up, uh, you've gone last a couple of times. Why don't you go first? I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> I think finding that work-life balance 
um, I don't I don't know what it's like for everybody else. Uh, I, I, so I'm in the Washington DC area and unfortunately there are not a lot of therapists of color. And over the past couple of years with everything that's happened with uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement with the anti-Asian sentiment, a lot of uh, clients of color have reached out. And uh, my colleagues who are also uh, fellow therapists of color, we've all been maxed out and, um, you know, sort of finding that balance of needing to limit my caseload, but also recognize that the need is so, the demand is so high. So I think that's been something that I've been working towards is how do I, you know, maintain a caseload in private practice, but also because I do have a little bit of guilt being in private practice. How do I also, um, you know, provide some of my time and services to folks who may not be able to, you know, pay for or have the resources to see a, a therapist in private practice? So whether it's um, the Afghan refugees, there's some uh, Afghan refugees who are in the Northern Virginia area, you know, being able to give up some time or being able to uh, provide some patients with a sliding scale or reduced, you know, fee scale or being able to consult with nonprofits. You know, it's, it's, I've, I've tried to find ways to make sure that I'm providing services to people who may not have uh, those resources, but also being mindful that if I'm completely emotionally depleted, then I can't necessarily be completely there and present for my patients as well. So I think finding that, that balance is something that I think is an ongoing process. And yeah. I would say it's challenging, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I still really love what I do. So um, it's just part of the, the process of that. Yeah, I think um, most people that I talk to that work in psychology and human services, I think that that is a, a very present part of, of that, of, of the jobs, right? Where when you're giving so much of yourself is how do you find, find that balance? Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Brian L, Brian E, what would you say is the most challenging part of your, your role? Um, I think for me, it goes back to kind of a different, a couple of different roles that I've had over the years in that, um, uh, Brian might be able to speak to this too. We're not in a private practice setting. Um, especially when I worked in, uh, like community corrections, probation, uh, the department of corrections, people are not working with you, um, because they're volunteering to, they, are sent there um, and have no choice really. Um, the choice they have is how they'd like to engage, how much, how motivated they are. Um, so I think some of the biggest challenges I have faced is um, kind of meeting people where they are at, seeing what their motivation level is and working with a lot of people that are um, not super motivated. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably learned about like the stages of change, still very pre-contemplative about whether they want to make change or not, um, which can make their buy-in and engagement in the work you're trying to do um, very difficult, you know, tense, frustrating at times. So I would say just, you know, making sure that you're uh, kind of watching out for that and uh, watching out for burnout in yourself if you're working with that type of population, which it sounds like a lot of you might be if you want to be in the criminal justice field. Yeah, that's a very uh, a very good point, right? Like uh, what, what you get from the people who are working from you is very contingent on their own motivation levels. Uh, Brian E? Yeah, I think, I think an over an overarching theme for me would be just, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, you're working with people that are disenfranchised, people that are hurting, people that are in a lot of pain, you know, they're coming to you for help. Um, you know, they're not coming to you because things are going so well. They just thought, well, maybe, maybe I just want to, you know, do a little bit better. Right. I mean, there's just people that, um, like I said, have been disenfranchised and are looking for help. And I think whatever field you're in, I, I think psychology, you know, criminal justice, um, social work, human services, you're going to deal with topics like suicidality. You're going to deal with uh, just very difficult topics. You know, Dr. Hong Huber mentioned like, you know, depression, anxiety, some very, uh, just very significant, you know, mental health kind of stressors that, you know, you're going to be working with people that are experiencing. Um, so those are just some of the things that come to mind that I think are probably the most you know, challenging part of the day to day. It's interesting, but all of your challenges go hand in hand with what you find the most rewarding, which I think is something very unique about the, the human services field. <laughs> um, uh, one of our next questions is um, talking about internships. And so when um, students are thinking about internships, um, 
they're struggling to understand what type of internship, um, because most of the traditional psychology or human services internships require previous experience or some sort of credential. Can you maybe talk a little bit about some opportunities where students would be able to get skills that would relate to the human services and psychology fields and some of the things that, you, that you've seen? I don't know if that question makes sense. I, I rephrased the student's question a little bit. <laughs> a couple of things that jump out to me, at least for, for social work, you know, uh, Brian L, maybe you'll have another idea, but I, I, I generally recommend places like uh, hospital settings um, to kind of get an all-encompassing experience. Um, you, you know, you'll, you can see a broad range of like different floors and units and different providers. You can see social work or psychology interacting with the medical side of the house, um, something that we kind of see here at the VA a bit. Um, and I would, you know, I was, so I, I would suggest kind of a hospital setting if you get into that or, you know, look at, you know, some community-based settings, sometimes like a, you know, a shelter or um, some other homeless services provider, maybe something in your local community that you can get involved with that, that still provides the supervision and provides the criteria you need to actually have a have the internship count you know you want it to be still professional and clinical but you know those are two areas that I would you know I would encourage I think have worked for you know quite a few students before and even before that right like I, I feel like I vaguely remember you work you had a volunteer was it a volunteer experience at Salvation Army was that you no am um, I misremembering this from last year so I, I worked there as an, as an intern. So that was okay. so actually my, my first internship in my graduate program was, you know, was there at the shelter. And, and the good thing about, you know, like I said, kind of some of these communities programs, um, you know, they, they can be multifaceted too, you know, that they can have like, they can have the shelter or a different, um, like maybe a clothing closet or a food pantry, or maybe some sort of outpatient programming or day treatment programming. So that, you know, there can be kind of different, you know, angles you can kind of come at it or different, different types of experiences you can gather um, from being in that setting. Yeah, anybody else want to talk a little bit about ways that students would be able to get some skills? Try now? I can't tell if you're looking to talk or you froze. <laughs> I think... I think he might have froze. We'll um, give him a, I think oh, there I was goes. frozen. Can you hear me? There you go. Now you go. I hear you now. <laughs> oh, now you're frozen again. All right. We'll give you a minute. Dr. Hong Hooper, you want to jump in? We'll give uh, Brian's <laughs> internet a second to catch up. <laughs> sure. I, I, was, I, I certainly echo what Brian has said about uh, reaching out to community mental health clinics or hospitals. I think a couple other places that come to mind. So if, I think nonprofit organizations. So I think I've heard of folks who have um, volunteered uh, or interned at like NAMI. So I think NAMI is a pretty big nonprofit. Um, I also know folks, uh, some of my own sort of classmates or colleagues who had volunteered for some of these crisis hotlines. So I think um, those are some great places because you might be able, to, speaking of your question of how do you get some skills, you know, you might be able to at least be able to, you know, gain some skills about how do you work uh, with um, helping sort of uh, diffuse the situation or helping somebody be able to, even if it's doing a couple deep breathing or asking some questions or just having them on the phone and sort of helping to um, sort of like deregulate what's happening or, um, you know, help them with some coping skills. I think those might be some um, places to start with is, you know, looking at nonprofit organizations or some of these crisis hotlines because they have people who will train you to be able to, at some point, once you're comfortable, um, be able to take some of these calls. And I imagine, you know, you're also learning skills to help um, eventually if you want to do clinical work, but these might be some um, appropriate skills or coping strategies to have in hand. Thanks so much. Uh, Brian L, looks like you're unfrozen. Do you want to try again? Yeah, sorry. I think I heard most of what um, Brian and Christina said, and I think they covered some ways to get volunteer experience. I would also say really lean on that you're going to. So John J., in this case, um, put it back on them to make sure you get into an internship that you enjoy. If it's something that you don't think you're getting something out of, see if you can go into 
something else. And a lot of schools are very good now and have a lot of good community relationships with places where you shouldn't necessarily need a ton of prior experience or need to do a ton of work on your own in order to be able to get into places that, you know, they're partnered with. So um, I would recommend to just have a good uh, relationship with your field instructor, you know, field department. Awesome. And while, while I have you, I just wanted to know if you could just expand a little bit on your work when you were working in corrections, because I do think that's an area of particular interest where criminal justice and the field of psychology and human services has, the, has had a crossover in your, your trajectory. We'll sure. see if your internet will hold out. Yeah. Sure. So after I did a couple years, after I did a couple years of outpatient, I switched to probation, which I was very interested in since I had done um, my second field placement in grad school in treatment court, um, which, as many of you know, is uh, criminal, uh, criminal justice um, clients going through the court system in lieu of probation or jail or prison time. And so I got access to probation and parole in the court system, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I switched to probation, which is sort of a mixture of social work and law enforcement, really. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I would have done it forever. Um, it is fun if you're interested in both of those. It's a great position to have. Um, for me, since at that point, I had already went on and finished grad school after about four or five years there, I was looking to advance a little bit more clinically, and I could not do that there, um, even in the prison system where they have like mental health clinics. Um, it still was not something that I was able to do. And when I say advance, I mean, have somebody that is supervising you that has that LCSW experience, experience is a psychiatrist or a PsyD um, uh, uh, and can basically give you supervision about what you're doing so that you can advance your degree. Um, so I did move away from from probations and corrections to the VA so I could continue to work on that. Um, however, in terms of just day to day, I enjoyed that time and job the most out of anything that I've done in the field. And what did it, what, what did it look like for you on a day to day basis when you're working? Um, were you in the prison? Were you were the, the the folks who were incarcerated? Were they taken to a kind of a, an outside area? I think that it's really interesting for the students because to understand like what it what it looks like in practice, I think, because I think that this is um, of, of particular interest. Sure. Um, probation. Um... I'll talk about real quick first is sort of like you go into the office and you have days where people come in and you meet with them and you report with them like how you management style like one-on-one -on -one session um, and then you spend days out in the field and go see them at their place of employment home whatever can you guys still hear me okay mm -hmm. okay um, so it's kind of a mixed year, like, um, being at your office and, uh, interviewing or having them report and being in the field and seeing them where they live and work. And then, um, working in the prison every day, I work in correctional, which is actually in Attica next to Attica, the one I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Attica is familiar with that hack in the prison. So um, inmates could put in a request to speak with just like they could a doctor or a nurse to speak with a mental health counselor or a psychiatrist for like mental health medications. And then within 24 to 48 hours, we would go out and see them in a like a makeshift um, office or clinic in the prison setting 
and meet with them to discuss what they would like to talk about. Um, also on a regular basis, you would interview and assess each inmate when they came in to make sure they were safe to be in that location in terms of um, their mental health level. Were they okay to be there or do they need more specific mental health needs? You would track them as they went through the system through them requesting your assistance or through just regular contacts based on their level of need. And then before they would leave and be discharged um, or be seen by the parole board, you would kind of do an updated assessment um, to let um, the parole board know how, how they're at mentally, how they're doing um, in the prison. Um, and so if they get released on parole, the parole officer that starts watching them in the community again, full circle, um, has information to go off of in terms of their uh, mental health and like psychological uh, disposition. No, I'm on mute. I'm gonna um, keep going. I have so, a few more questions that folks have submitted. Um, as we said, if you have any questions of anything that you've heard, something you want to dig a little bit deeper in, please don't hesitate, raise your hand, um, put your questions in the chat. Um, so our next question is, would you suggest going to graduate school after getting your bachelor's in forensic psychology? And I guess I would open that up a little bit and talk maybe a little bit about how you decided on the particular graduate school programs that you that you did. I mean, maybe some points that students could think about whether or not they're interested in going to grad school and if they are, how to decide among all these different programs and schools and what are some key elements that you um, would find useful for students to really pay attention to as part of that process. I don't know if anybody wants to try first. <laughs> I think if you want to advance, you know, not just your career professionally, but your, your clinical skills, you definitely, yeah, I, I, would, I would always encourage folks to go for their master's right away and start that process. Um, I, I, I imagine there's some programs where you can kind of bridge it, but, you know, I, I would definitely encourage going for master's right away. And just, again, solidifying, your, your own professional skills, your, your own resume, um, just so you can kind of keep advancing yourself and advancing, you know, the work that you do. Um, so I think that's, you know, really important. So, you know, I can't imagine, um, you know, I, I do understand sometimes people want to wait, but, but, you know, I think the general consensus is, you know, go for the master's right away and, you know, whatever, whatever particular field that you feel you want to, you want to do, that would be my, my general idea. Dr. Hong Huber, Brian L., anything to add? I guess I would echo Brian that, and I could be co completely off, but I think it's really hard to um, really go further in psychology or in the mental health field, whether it's social or counseling without at least a master's. And I think one of the lovely things about being in a, a graduate program is you get further supervised training. Granted, of course, you could get training um, you know, once you finish or even before you go to a program. But I mean, I think one of the great things that I got from being in uh, graduate programs is that I got to try so many different um, settings, so many fields um, uh, in terms of inpatient or outpatient community mental health, uh, college counseling. So it really showed me what are some of the context or clinical settings that I really liked versus what I didn't like versus what I you know, thought would be a good fit for me. So I think having graduate program, uh, graduate training right away, you really get to further figure out what is sort of the right population, what's the settings that you would really prefer. And also I think it's just, it's just really nice to have some more supervised, um, you know, trading right out of the bat. Um, in, in terms of forensic, I know I really can't provide much insight into it, but I do have some colleagues who are in my doc uh, doctoral program did forensic work. Um, I believe that a lot of them were in, I think in prisons. And I think they also did a lot of work um, I think for the court system to so doing a lot of evaluations um, to see whether folks were fit to stand trial or I think um, assessing to see like the accuracy of some of these statements. Uh, please don't quote me on that. I obviously am not in the forensics track, but I do know that if you uh, wanted to go the psychology route, I to work with counseling, but for the psychology route, um, I do have a number of colleagues who had 
come in, uh, gotten their study and really specialized or, co or concentrated on sort of the forensic uh, track and did, I think, primarily focusing on a lot of these evaluations for the court, for the court system. Yeah, that's, uh, there's so many paths as we talked about, right? And I think it's just trying to figure out and find the, the right one that's, that's right for you. And so I think that that is, um, one piece to, to, to take note of that Dr. Hong Hoover is talking about, right? When you're looking at a grad program, one thing that's really important to, to think about is if you want to be able to explore these different areas and really find the right niche for you or the right, the right population or the, the inpatient outpatient is to find a program that will support that exploration, right? So you want to be able to find um, a program that that includes and it has those different opportunities embedded into the way that that program is structured. Because there are many different types of uh, a masters of social work, masters of psychology. And so each of them and each of school really can look just a little bit different. Um, and so it's important to, to take that into account. Brian Al, do you have anything to add about grad school and thinking about where to go? Um, not, uh, Brian and Dr. Hong Huber, I think, pretty much covered everything. Once it, one thing I will say is that um, in the state of New York specifically, a lot of um, behavioral health, human services jobs are through the government. So like county, state, or like VA federal. Um, and most of, if not all of them, uh, require like civil service examination before you can even get an interview for a job. And most of the jobs in the field of human services that you would want require at least um, a graduate degree. So um, a bachelor's level, um, you would be able to do some like assistant um, positions and then maybe work your way up with time. But that's usually to give you time to go on and get a graduate degree. So, yeah, I would also recommend it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, we had uh, Christy Arisi, I, I think, join us. Is she here? Yay, Christy, how are you? I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. So we're, um, we've been asking some questions. So uh, if you want to just share a little bit about um, who you are, your path, um, and your journey through college and your, your current role. Sure. Um, I'm actually a John Jay College of Criminal Justice alumni. Yeah, bloodhounds, right? Um, and I'm also a baby from uh, Silverman School of Social Work, right? That's where I graduated. And I'm not going to mention the years because I don't want to give away my age. Um, by trade, I am an LCSW as well as a KSAC, um, which is a credential alcohol and substance abuse counselor, family development specialist, and a whole lot of other things. Um, my path was originally I graduated as a criminologist or with a criminology degree, um, and I wanted to understand really why black and brown folks were um, just in general being treated as criminals, right? So this is my population. I'm Afro-Latina, and I didn't understand growing up why my populations were so criminalized, right? Why were there so many drugs in my community? Why were so many of my neighbors passing away? Why were so many of my friends addicted? So John Jay kind of like fostered that way into research. And then I decided uh, over time to really go into community organizing um, and find out why were there issues of slum landlordism? Um, why weren't people of color um, getting better wages, right? Like with our competitive parts, why weren't women having competitive wages with males? And uh, they had higher degrees and things like this. So um, in my path, what I decided to do was really begin to look at research, really begin to look at policy, um, and really go full force into that and try to change that. The way that I did that was through community organizing of, of advocacy work. Um, and then um, I did a lot of advocacy work with gangs uh, in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx and in Bushwick and Brooklyn. Um, and then um, I decided to become a clinician right, after a long time of organizing and a lot of advocacy work um, to find out and destigmatize uh, the taboo and discussions of why mental health issues are such a problem in communities of color. Like, why don't we talk about it? Um, and why don't we want to be labeled as a person who is crazy? So um, I'm on my path now to finishing my PhD because all I want to do now is write policy for 
uh, for black and brown folks, right? I wanna, un I wanna write policy that makes sense um, for our populations um, and to make them fair and equitous um, without, with causing the least amount of harm. So that's kind of the path that I'm on right now. And that's been my life journey. Did I miss anything? That's a whole lot of talking. I think the only thing is if you could just talk about, I, you may have said it and I may have missed it, but what are, what are your, you were criminology and then what was your specific degree that you got in, in grad school? Um, so the first was my MSW in social work. Um, and I graduated as a generalist uh, because I was heavily into community organizing. And then I started specializing as a clinician. And my second master's degree was in public, um, is in public planning and public administration um, because I wanted to understand why buildings and colors affect communities of color. Like why do we walk into a space and feel like we're in an asylum kind of thing? So um, those two, I decided that those two should be married together um, because it really speaks to how to help a population by looking at this space and changing it up to make the person feel uh, safe in that, in that the space that you're practicing. Awesome. And so just um, knowing what I know about you, I'm going to jump back and just ask you one of our questions. And um, <laughs> um, so students are talking about some trouble finding internships when they think about psychology. And so some of the folks here have shared some ways to get skills. And so what are some popular opportunities that you've seen for students who um, that, where they can get some of these entry level skills without being credentialed, without having finished their degree um, to really set themselves up to be able to get those next things further yeah. on. Absolutely, Jessica. Unions, right? Unions right now. And when I say this, I'm talking about people that are organizing in different placement types. That's community based organizations, as well as hospital settings and outpatient settings. Um, if you are a psychology major or any kind of human services major, you should look at um, union sites like DC 37, 1199, SEIU, and see the internship opportunities that they have available. There are many, right? This is, these are not small unions. Um, the other thing is, is that they also have paid positions where they start you off with your bachelor's at a bachelor's degree level. And then they have what we call reimbursement funds um, where you pay for school and they reimburse you at a very specific rate so that um, you can continue on with your graduate experience. Awesome, thank you so much. So as I've said, ask us your questions. Um, Oh yeah, so one of the one of the folks is asking if you could put those in. Yes, I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a student who is interested in becoming a lawyer, specifically working with um, juveniles. Um, some folks have talked about getting a law degree. Others have talked about getting a master's of social work. Um, and so the student is looking for input on whether they should go to grad school or law school, and maybe what are some factors to think about when wanting to work with young folks who are part of the, the current system. Are you asking me, Jessica? Uh, open, to the, open to the panel. If you want to kick us off, if you have insights, then happy, happy to start with you. Sure. So um, community-based organizations like Osborne Association, Catholic Charities, um, there are many others, Center for Community Alternatives. There are many students who start in community-based organizations like that. And what they do is they pair them with different types of mentors um, that can help them lead, you know, lead them through their way. Like here, maybe you should go to graduate school because maybe you, you, you like the idea of being a lawyer, but maybe you wanna do a little bit more of the human services side um, where you wanna be an advocate instead of a lawyer. So um, I often say when you graduate from your bachelor's degree or you're in your bachelor's degree, it's a good opportunity for you to take on that inter internship so you can get mentored in the way that you want to go. But it also provides you like a duplicitous experience, meaning you get to see the human services side and you get to see the, the side of, of where people practice law and what that really looks like. Anybody else? Um, I um, guess Dr. I'll Hollywood. add on to you. Oops. Yes, please. Sorry. No, okay. no. Um, I was just going to call on you because I was like, it looked like you're going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Actually, I was just going to add on to what Chrissy was saying. I think that's uh, so invaluable, seeing if you can get a little bit more insight into if you're more interested in sort of the mental health or advocacy versus law. But talking a little bit more, I guess, logistically, um, I know some folks who have uh, gotten sort of a dual JD, PsyD, or JD, PhD, if they want to have, you know, more information into sort of uh, being able to uh, provide you know, have, have knowledge and insight into both the mental health and, and legal fields. And then I've also, I also knew some folks who just went the uh, law school route and, um, you know, they're, they serve as a guardian ad litem for a lot of children. So I think what Christy is saying probably is the most important thing if you get, get insight, if, if you're more interested in a certain path, but if not, you know, maybe a, a dual program like a JD, PsyD or JD, PhD might be one route, or if not um, going sort of the um, the law school JD route and seeing if they have maybe specializations in mental health. So I was just talking more specifically with regards to kind of the logistics of what different paths there might be. Yeah, no, that's super helpful and goes back to that point of like trying to explore and find grad programs and, and um, that offer paths that you're interested in. Uh, Brian, did you want to add anything to that too? Um, just to kind of echo that and um, I have friends that have I assume it's still a program did a dual degree um, JD MSW I know in Western New York um, University of Buffalo is a program that does that and if you can find those dual degree programs it will allow you to go through in a time period that would be less than doing both of them separately so I think like everyone said, getting the insight into what you really want to do. But if you do want both degrees, doing research to find a program that would maybe allow you to get them done more efficiently as a, a dual program. Yeah, if it's something that you know you you want to do both, then, you know, two birds, one stone. It's not really two birds, one stone. You do just as probably just as much work, but do it all at, all at the same time. Um, uh, one of our next questions is... Um, thinking about the particular populations of clients that you all work with. And so the question is, is there a particular population of clients that you work with often or that you prefer to work with? Um, and I would um, add to that, like I, like I usually do, is how did you figure out that that was the population that you particularly like working with or that you found fulfillment working with is maybe a better way to say it. Brian, you want to talk a little bit? I know you've talked a little bit about you just kind of st stumbled into, I don't want to say stumbled. You were very lucky to figure it out early on. Um, yeah, I, I gracefully stumbled into, you know, working with, uh, with homeless, which I think was great. And I, and, you know, I, I think, so it's sort of, it's all encompassing, right? I mean, homelessness, substance abuse, mental health, these things aren't, they don't discriminate. You know, we, we do see kind of larger, um, like, uh, you know, large people of color are, are you know, we're largely affected in this, right? With, in terms of homelessness, in terms of, um, like I said, substance use, mental health. But I think my appreciation really came, you know, after being at the men's shelter, the youth shelter, the women's shelter here in the city of Rochester, I really just had an appreciation for the veterans I've started working with. And that's kind of where my heart has been, you know, since now being at the VA. Um, so it, it just, I, I would say just being with the homeless population in general, it, it's sort of, um, it sort of kind of, you know, I would say covers all areas from, from basic needs to, you know, like we've already said, some of the, the mental health situations, legal is a part of that. I know some people are interested in getting their Juris Doctorate. Um, so I would just say just, just because of just how much it covers, you know, the, the, the scope is so broad, but like I said, for, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's homelessness and then kind of working, like I said, with uh, veterans in particular. So that's kind of where my, my heart is at. Anybody else? I would just say that to add on to what Ryan said that um, my experience has been um, the population I work with, even if it's been from substance use to mental health to criminal justice system to the VA, um, none of those problems like happen in a vacuum. So you tend to have the same population even if you're going into kind of a different area in the field, um, in many instances, um, just as an example, I have literally um, interviewed people for the court in my role as probation and then worked with them in my role that I have now at the VA, you know, same person, 
same issues continuing just um, accessing assistance from a different source so yeah I, I would take this to a cultural perspective everybody I just want to say like if you find something wrong in your community and it burns a fire in you right you feel a flame in your stomach that may be the population that you're going to work with and work for. I always say in this field, you have to be passionate about the work that you do. I love to talk about drugs. I love to talk to people about cannabis and I like to educate people related to both positive and negative effects of many different outcomes of their life. That's how I chose my population right? That's how, because the passion I have for talking about substance use and to see someone to help themselves really helped me to make that determination that that is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. So again, if you feel the fire, that may be a great segue for you to figure out the population that you really want to work with. And Jessica, I'm sorry that I, I'm running late again, but I do want to say that there are many things in the chat that I, I, I kind of um, put in there for you. The 1199 SEIU jobs that you could take, there's both internships and paid work there. There's also um, the Office of Children and Family Services that also has both paid internships as well as employment, right? They're hiring right now at, at a bachelor's level. And the final is, uh, which most people in human services don't go for, that includes lawyers, doctors, human, all kinds of human services professionals. There are state jobs um, that hire at the bachelor's level um, that also help with reimbursement for graduate school, right? It's always nice to be paid <laughs> right right after you get your bachelor's degree and um and and have somebody else pay for your school so again i left that information for you in the chat um and i hope that you're able to use that so mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much i think that um it's a uh, a reality that many of our students have to work and so being able to couple these um amazing opportunities that are related to their field with something that's paid is the best of both worlds um yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think uh, Kristen in the chat is, is echoing your, your sentiments, Christy, right? Like when you, when you feel the, um, inspired and you feel passionate about a group, it's, it's important to pay attention to that. And I think that that is one of the areas where building relationships with mentors in the field and with your faculty and really building your network will help you understand what's possible. I always say, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And trying to find where the crossover is in these jobs and then the, this path and what you're passionate about sometimes can take a little bit of time, um, but, but it exists, right? You just have to get connected with the right people and, and really continue and, and um, stay, stay on the path to finding it. Um, anybody, I think, Dr. Hong Huber, do you wanna say anything about the populations that you work with? I think that yours would probably be a little, the most different. Um, <laughs> probably. Um, and I don't, I can't speak for the counseling or the social work field, but I know in psychology, um, the workforce is predominantly white, which is not, it's not really proportional to the people that seek out therapy. So for me, it was really important to be able to, you know, provide culturally responsive therapy to, to you know, clients of color. Um, as I said, especially in the Washington DC area, surprisingly, even though it's a big city, there are not a lot of therapists of color. So um, it's also not surprising that the majority of folks I work with are people of color, um, black, brown, Asian folks, uh, uh, not surprisingly, a large majority of the folks of color I work with are Asian American because they seek me out because I think there are just certain cultural nuances that perhaps non-Asian or non-BIPOC, um, you know, therapists may understand, not to, say, not to say that they can't, but I think it's been really helpful to see that maybe one, one slight glimmer out of everything that's happened racially in the past two years is that it has really encouraged, you know, people of color to go out and seek therapy. So in terms of, I think the mental health stigma is still there, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to, um, you know, lessen, I think, as people start to become a little bit more open and comfortable with seeking mental health support. Yeah, thanks so much. And it actually segues, um, quite nicely with what the next question that we have um, that students submitted is how has the stigma 
um, surrounding the field of psychology and human services changed over the past um, couple of years? And how do you think it will continue to change going forward? Any thoughts? What, so one that jumps out at me, at least for, for social work or human services, I think there's kind of been a stigma of, well, I, you know, if I, if I somehow go and seek help, that, that's, that somehow means I'm less or that I, you know, I, it mean, makes me less of a person than, some, than someone else. Um, I think we're getting away from that. I think we're getting into more of a screening in versus screening out um, kind, of, kind of mindset. I, I think we're getting to that you know, everybody needs help, you know, or everybody struggles at different times. So I, so it's really okay to kind of seek out, again, seek out a clinical psychologist, seek out, you know, a social worker, seek out, um, you know, legal assistance and different things. It doesn't make you any less of a person. You know, it's just, you, you know, you're still a person, you're still, you know, still have value. Um, so I think that is, at least for me, and again, this is a very small scope. This is only, you know, six or seven years, but this is just kind of, you know, just my little anecdotal take. Um, you know, when you mentioned stigma, but just how I kind of see it. Yeah. Anybody else? Sure. I can say this from a cultural perspective. The pandemic has broken the box. And the reason why I'm saying that is simply because previously, um, Black and brown folks that really not, they, they, they just were not aware of their history. There was an intergenerational trauma that was going on where they just didn't want to be called crazy. What the pandemic did was, poof, it just broke it open and said, here's some information that you did not know about your culture. This is how black, black folks were treated. This is how brown folks were treated. This is how women were treated. Now let's talk about why this is considered a taboo in your culture. So the pandemic said, hey, now here's your history. Let's talk about how to normalize this process. Let's talk about normalizing mental health. Now, we're, we're not there yet, right? We're still having mistrust issues because that's a lot of generations of, of mistrust. There's a lot of generations of misinformation. However, we're going in the right direction, which means people are now being educated on the history of the asylumatic approach. People are now being educated on the history of experimentation on the particular group. And now um, they're putting into practice um, natural means of communication. So that means people are getting pushed more and more to their spiritual advisors. There is now an opening for telehealth and telephonic care, right? Which means you don't have to step into an office now. You can actually call somebody and have a conversation or therapy on the phone or via text um, or via uh, platforms that are on, online like Zoom. So what what what's changing is the, the nature of the information that's being pushed out there, the normalizing of mental health and substance use disorders, as well as the treatment types that are available for all communities. So I feel like we're heading in the step of the right direction. We're not there yet. And it's beginning to destigmatize the idea that if you go to therapy and or treatment or seek out social services, that like Brian was saying, you're not less than. People need help. That's what we're here for. So. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so we're, we're coming to the end. Um, uh, and so I want to close this out with uh, one last question. And so what uh, advice would you have for first and second year students who are interested in your field? Get a mentor. <laughs> And how would you find a mentor, Christy? Sorry, Brian. How would you find a mentor, Christy? Expand on that for me. Absolutely. So um, if you're part of the human services, and I'm going to speak directly about uh, the human services or the human services and community justice major, there are professors that are there as well as the field education specialist, as well as other um, adjuncts who are there that are willing to mentor. If you are a part of other departments, I would say speak to the chairs and or speak to your professor and see if you can provide a mentorship that way. Or let's say you don't want to do it at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, but you still want to do your academic work here. What you might want to do is look into one of those groups that I sent you in the chat. There are mentoring programs in each of those that I have sent you, um, as well as people who are in the field. Um, and there's internships. 
doing internships. Not all internships are unpaid. That's not my level of expertise. What I would tell you to do is go to the career center, right? Because <laughs> we do have that there and seek out information related to how you can um, do an internship, whether it was paid or unpaid. Thanks so much, Brian. Sorry to cut you off there before. <laughs> So I would never, I'm not telling people to put themselves like an unsafe or really uncomfortable situation, but, but try new things. And you might be, it may not be, it may be unfamiliar to you or it might be uncomfortable at first, right? You might be around either in a setting or a group of people or just in a, in a, just in an agency you're not familiar with, but, but just throw yourself in it and try it and, you know, give it an honest try. Um, I, I would, like I said, I, I would just encourage people to try more, just really try to expand and, you know, put yourself in kind of unfamiliar settings. Not, not saying to be unsafe or anything, but just, you know, sometimes something might be uncomfortable at first, but you may really grow to, to love it and enjoy it. Yeah, I think that you don't know what you don't know until you know it, right? So either you're going to decide you like it or you're going to decide you don't like it and then you know to avoid it. <laughs> Dr. Hong Hoover, Brian L., anything to close this out? I guess I would ask you know, the best way I think you're starting to you're starting to break up for just a second. Is that happening for other people or is it just my computer? Is it cutting out? Yeah, we can't hear her at all. I don't know what shape. Um try again for me. Can you hear me now? It's working for me. We'll see. Saying I, oh no, no, it's cutting out again. Maybe type it in the chat. Maybe to okay. put it in the chat. Yeah, I don't know what changed. I guess this is the joy of technology, right? Learning to be creative problem solvers. Brian Al, do you have anything to add about what advice would you have for first and second year students? Um, I don't have too much to add. I think it's been covered. Don't worry too much about knowing exactly what you want to do in your first and second year like Ryan and others have said I think it's more about having experiences and you know stuff that you're interested in maybe even try something that you're not interested in and just you know not passing things up and then hopefully as you go you'll have a clearer picture but not you know beating yourself up or being too hung up on I need to know exactly what I want to do at a certain point in time you know a year in or two years in. Yeah, I think I think that's the the case for most people who uh, uh, really don't really know what they want to do until they just find it, and then it's just like this aha moment. And I think you have to do some searching sometimes to find that aha moment. Aha moment. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you so much to our special guests, to Brian Al, Brian E, Dr. Hong Huber, uh, Christy, Dr., uh, Professor Risti. I actually, I don't know how you introduced yourself at the beginning. I didn't write it down. Um, and I wanted to just take a moment to share. We have one last um, upcoming event as part of the Explorations of Your Future Self series. It's it's tomorrow during community hour from 140 to 55 and it's uh, about social entrepreneurship so check it out um, hopefully we'll see you there and if not have a wonderful last couple of days enjoy these few days off before finals and a huge round of applause thank you again to our panel and sharing your time your expertise your interests and uh, have a wonderful monday thanks so much everybody